meant that the Pakistan, you know, economy suffered. We, you know, we not only suffered casualties, we also suffered, you know, economic losses. And then we obviously had a democratic government come again, you know, in 2008. 2008 to 2018, I would say, uneventful, you know, kind of economic performance, because even in those uh, years, we did not fix the, the uh, uh, kind of, you know, the structural imbalances, structural flaws which we had, and all through this period, which is the, the you know, I would say, 25 to 30 years, you know since 2000 and, uh, you know, 1972-73, we just kept building, you know, the, we kept on, uh, uh, you know, a kind of uh, uh, living with the structural imbalances. And what were the structural imbalances? Structural imbalances were that our tax to GDP was pathetic, you know, was, you know, uh, always hovered around 10 percent, you know, which is not enough. Uh, to meet, you know, the, uh, not only the current expenditure, but also the development expenditure. We, of course, had a mismatch between our exports and our imports that would always put pressure on us. Uh, but the, the, another structural imbalance which continues even today is the saving rate. Unless you have a saving rate which can support 6 to 8 percent growth rate, which means that, you know, your saving rate should be north of 25 percent. We always had a saving rate 18 percent. So not good enough to, you know, to sustain a growth rate of 6 percent plus. Then we also, the productivity in our industrial sector, once, you know, the investment stopped, you know, because after nationalization, who the hell would just invest in Pakistan, you know, because they were not even treated very well once the nationalization took place. So productivity went down. Agriculture, we just ignored. We thought this is a given that we will produce wheat, we will produce, you know, uh, uh, other food uh, items. So, so it was given. So we never focused on improving the productivity of the agriculture sector. So guess what? We are food short, short as of now. We are a food deficit country as of now. So no structural changes, etc. And in comes, you know, uh, PTI government in 2018, faced with a, with a uh, current account deficit of 20, per, uh, you know, 20 billion dollars, had to pay another 10 billion dollars in, for, in, in, in uh, for foreign currency loans, and went around, you know, trying to gather money from friends. Well, they helped us, but not good enough, so we basically had to go to the IMF. IMF, as you know, has a cookie-cutter approach. They like to take out the demand from the economy that uh, at, at that stage the economy was growing at around 6 percent on the rebased basis and they just basically took the demand out and we just uh, within a year we, we just you know our growth rate dropped to around 3 percent. What did they do? They you know depreciated the rupee, they increased the discount rate, uh, they just uh, slapped you know uh, uh, you know uh, higher uh, utility uh, uh, payments. Now, all that meant that we actually had to slow down the economy so that the demand, which extra demand, which was creating problems for us, had to go away. So, well, the government was trying the, its best, and I think it was trying its best to, to cope with this situation uh, uh, till, you know, they face another major crisis, and that's COVID-19. So COVID-19 came in, in uh, 2019, and during that period, I would say that I must give full credit to the Prime Minister and his imaginative way of handling that COVID, whereby we probably ranked one of the top three in, in the response to COVID and the way we responded. And he kept on investing in agriculture, kept on investing in industry and, and exports, and kept on investing in housing. And by the way, housing was a new area because in Pakistan, you know, mortgage to GDP was 0.25 percent, you know, when he took over, you know, a power. Why? Because the foreclosure law was defective, banks would not lend, and so we were one of those countries actually not using, you know, the construction sector productively. So I am a banker, I know that we kept trying, and he, he because he, he has a lot of perseverance, so he just 
uh, uh, fixed the foreclosure law and industry, you know, started, you know, to yield some results. So by 2021 June, the economy actually, uh, the surprise of everybody was growing at 5.6%. Not bad at all. Because a year before that, it had a negative growth of 1% like any, every other country in the world. But the, the V curve was around 6.6%. That's great. That's when I just joined the, uh, the government. And then we decided that, no, we are now going to grow the economy because we have a major problem that our employment, we need employment. So we need something happening here. Oh, okay. So uh, we needed a growth, but we said that we will have inclusive and sustainable growth. And, uh, bec and because we never had sustainable growth, so every three, four years when we would grow, the uh, accounting we will fall, we'll go to the IMF. We actually by now have gone 23 times to the IMF.
Thirdly, we believe the, uh, the one thing which will help us bridge the gap between imports and exports is IT. And we are giving all kind of concessions to the IT industry that it should grow. Last year it grew by 47 percent. This year they are probably going to be growing at 70 percent. And I said, you tell me what you need and I'll give it to you and you please grow by 100 percent every year. And if they keep growing 100 percent every year, in five years' time, the IT exporters that is going to dent the, the difference between the imports and exports. So that is the, where we are, we are heading. We are also looking at, you know, obviously our power sector, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, and the industrial sector, obviously the policies which we have given, not only to, to the large industries, we are also the SME. I think that should help us, you know, also uh, the, uh, grow the uh, small and medium because our large scale, you know, industry is growing at around 7% plus. But the SME, which, which is starved of everything else, including, you know, the, uh, the credit. If you look at, you know, the credit, it's, we have around 4 to 5 million, you know, SMEs, and only 180,000 SMEs get credit from the formal banking sector. That's not acceptable. So I think we have to just, uh, you know, basically give uh, help to, you know, to the, uh, to the SMEs, and I think this government is doing it for the first time. Now... We will be looking at, you know, how to fix the uh, energy sector as well. You know that, you know, we obviously were faced with overcapacity in, uh, in electric uh, generation. We, we had, you know, to pay capacity payments around 350 billion rupees a year when we took over uh, power. Last year, uh, this year, it is 850 billion rupees of uh, capacity payments of electricity we don't even use. By next year, it is over a trillion rupees. So we got to deal with this. This is hemorrhaging our, you know, financing, uh, the public sector finances. So I think we are uh, taking, you know, uh, multiple, you know, uh, kind of uh, steps to do that, fix that. Then there is this uh, illusion that our banking sector is very efficient and banking sector takes care of, you know, all the needs of, you know, our economy. I don't think so. The banking footprint is only 33 percent of GDP. And of that, they just lend, you know, less than 50 percent, which means only 14 percent of GDP is supported by the formal sector. We got to fix the financial sector because there is a problem, you know, in, in, uh, in resource, you know, uh, sharing. Uh, only nine cities consume 85 percent of, of credit and, and uh, 75 percent is corporate. Everything else is, you know, like peanuts. SME is 7 percent, consumer is 7 percent, agriculture 6 percent. We got to fix that. And obviously, if you look at, you know, uh, regional disparity. Yeah, okay. I'm back to normal. So, 
so so the banking sector the financial sector has to has to uh, become partner in the growth of the economy and i think it is not we also have to make sure that the the progress we have made on the housing and construction sector you know we keep doing it because all over the world you know the the housing sector is uh, you know x percentage of gdp uh, in in the us it is almost 80% and in and in india is 10 uh in thailand it is 26 around 40% in malaysia and we are less than 1% so unless we do not you know, uh, uh, you know and this this is uh, you know kind of widespread you know uh, uh, growth when when you know uh, and even out uh, you know, even growth all over the country when you do construction 40 40 industry actually starts you know growing so uh, that's very important then you know obviously the social sector i think we have spent a lot of money on esas and some very very good programs in esas whereby we just went to the the lower uh, segments of our society and we said we will take care of you then we said as i said inclusive and when we said inclusive we started programs like kamyab pakistan program kamyab jawan program and you know people will say oh these are those political programs which we governments introduce no no sir is they are not political program they are yes political in a sense that imran khan wanted to just set up a rasat e medina where they, they it has to be a welfare state where the low segments of our society have to be looked after let me give you example of kamyab pakistan kamyab pakistan program is a program whereby we don't do anything there is a number 5771 they just dial in they, they give their id card number it goes to the uh, esas database goes back to a pool and where you know these uh, you know uh, entities like akhwat you know nrsp and others and they are not government owned uh, entities they pick up those names and they go and talk to them negotiate the loans and give it to them totally transparent the only thing we do is we tell the wholesale banks to give money to the ngos and this um, and bfis which was not being done so it's a, it's it's a, it's a absolutely unique program that we thought by you know very very intelligent people and they said you know let's you know wholesale credit to these uh, you know uh, entities who was another and they'll retail the credit to to the people on the ground absolutely phenomenal and it is happening we are probably going to hit around 10 to 15 billion rupees a month which means 4 million families in 3 uh, to 5 years will get you know uh, agriculture loans interest free uh, uh, for business interest free for housing interest free obviously we have a huge you know um, uh, what we call a sehat card which is a phenomenal uh, you know product you know for every family and then we'll give skill training to to everybody a complete package for 4 million households this is what we call inclusive growth why because we are not going to just give fish to these people we are going to teach them how to catch fish and they will be standing on on, on their own feet within 3 to 5 years and that will give strength to this economy so what are we doing in in the long run then what we are doing over there is in the long run is we want to have an inclusive and sustainable growth which will carry us into the next 30 for 20 to 30 years and that's when we will become an economy what it used to be the fourth largest economy in 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 the 60s maybe even the next 10 15 years we are not the fourth largest economy but we certainly will be in one of the top 10 economies in asia and if we once we have that stable economy and stable economic growth i think you guys in petrochemical who know more about petrochemical can invest thank you very much